welcome to episode 2006 and greetings from Dokos, Greece. We just broke raft, as the sailors say, where we had 17 yachts tied together for the evening and had a lot of partying. So you're seeing me for the first time with no hangover, but that's good, but no shower either. So <laughs> there's my appearance. Now you know what I look like first thing in the morning. Anyway, we just broke raft and we are now headed to the next location here on day five of Yacht Week. And a couple pleasant surprises on this trip. Number one, great weather. It's been cool and crisp in the morning and not too hot in the afternoon. So it's been very, very pleasant in terms of weather. And also, I gotta tell you, maybe it's just a matter of the world and technology advancing nicely and quickly, but it has been such a pleasant surprise to see how good the internet access has been on this trip. I mean, many times along the route from the phone, 5G, really, really amazing, pleasantly amazing. So it's been a great trip and it will continue. Today we've got part two with rental housing economist Jay Parsons and got a lot of great comments on part one. I'm glad you all liked that and found some great insights there. So we will continue with that today and let's go ahead and listen in to part two on the rental housing economy. Your average mom and pop rental in your average affordable housing unit is not actually listed online where someone's surveying that rent, including it in a rent index. And so it's apples and oranges. Um, and so uh, I think what you have to be able to do is you don't track incomes the time of, of renewal, but you can look at two things. One, you, have to, you can actually, this is what we do. I think a lot of larger property managers, you want to look in small ones. You want to look at what's the rent income for actual households in your communities that for the time of lease signing. And then you want to look at your rent collection. People are still able to pay the rent. And on a national level and in most markets, um, we're still seeing rent income ratios for new leases in the low to mid 20% range. And we're seeing rent collections in the upper 90% range. And so that's for the market rate side. It's more challenging the affordable space. And so overall, it's a good story. Again, my concern though, is people who are not even in those numbers because they don't qualify to live in the units that are that are uh, available. That's, uh, that's a good point. You said a lot of stuff there. And a survey like that, that's comparing rent to income ratios is almost doing it sort of the way the housing affordability index does it right? And there's a lot of flaws in that because, you know, it, it doesn't survey who's buying what house. And it also doesn't count foreign money moving into a market. And it, yeah. of course, what it really doesn't count is people in a market that are already there buying a house, moving up and trading their equity. You know, it just looks at median income, median mortgage payment. And that's, that's very misleading. Yeah. Although it's a decent index other than that. But, you know, it does have a few big. Well, all of these things are challenging. That's why I think it's I think you're right. But I'm very skeptical. And I see these crazy numbers because, I mean, the reality is no one's leasing to someone paying half their income on rent. And it just doesn't happen. And so to say it's the median, it's like it's mathematically just very improbable to even get there unless it's an area like maybe, you know, maybe Miami, where it's so much retirement income or retirement money and foreign money, where it's not even a W-2. It's just they've got a lot of wealth and it makes it look like the rent income ratio is a little out of whack. Fair but, enough. But yeah, you know, that's interesting because I just had a guy who wanted to rent one of my houses who's retired, doesn't have an income, okay, or, you know, a big income. And, you know, the, the rent for this property was fairly high. And I said, well, you know, what's your income like? And he says, well, I'll just pay you a year in advance. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, you know. Yeah, he's, he's got so, savings, right? So. Yeah, so, so income wise, he is basically was telling me he wasn't going to qualify, right? Yeah. But, it, but he, he has money. It's not a problem. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, interesting. You'll take though you're up front, why not? So, yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. What about the institutional landlords owning single family homes? I'm talking about most yeah. of our listeners and audience are buying single family homes, some apartments too, but mostly single was... family. And this has really been a change coming out of the Great Recession, how we've seen just a huge level of interest from the big money, the smart money in single family homes, buying entire neighborhoods, huge portfolios, tens of thousands of single family homes. Overall though, compared to the rental market size, it's still a drop in the bucket, but it is bigger than it's ever been that I know of. Talk to us about that market, what's going on there, what your thoughts are for the future of it. 
Yeah, well, I mean, single family rental market is is really seeing. I think it, uh, you know, in some ways, I mean, just go back a little bit. You know, great financial crisis. You know, no one, everyone's struggling with uh, you know foreclosures and whatnot. End up, you know, obviously, as everybody knows, we start to see some institutional groups move in and buy single family rental homes, and then um, since then. Uh, you know, but they've continued to be a presence in this market. But, you know, even even now, I mean, Freddie Mac did a study, I think, a year ago showing that institutional landlords were, uh, I think it was less than 5%, maybe maybe a 6 I forget, it's low single, low mid single digit percentage of the market. Uh, but, you know, they tend to be sort of an outsized, um, you know, face of the market. And certainly, you know, I think what we've we've really seen in, in now, though, is that, you know, they're they've gone to the sidelines too. I mean, rates are high. They, they're using debt also. And also home prices are still high. Now, if only one of those things were true, I think they'd still be active buyers. But, um, you know, the combination of the two has certainly, I think, pushed a lot of folks to the sidelines at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, it sure has. So they're on the sidelines. So we've got this very weird market in real estate. I, I've been yeah. doing this an awfully long time. And it, it's just really... I still can't help but comment on it because we have very low inventory, yet demand has been, there's been a lot of demand destruction with the interest rate increases. So we've got sales activity down by, you know, depending on who you ask and where it is, they're talking about about 23% maybe decline in, in sales volume. Yeah. Uh, but still we have only about one third of the inventory of single family homes we need to be normal. You know, most people would say somewhere around there. Yeah. Normally, with these massive interest rate increases we've seen, you'd expect to see a flood of inventory coming on the market, and you'd expect to see a crash. Now, we're not seeing that at all. I mean, still, the what I call the crash bros <laughs> are out yeah. there hoping for a crash because they've you know mostly missed the market the last 10 years and they yes. want to get in and they tend to be rather jealous people about that. But what do you think about that? I mean, what do you make of this type of market? Yeah, you're right. No, it, it's, you know, it, it's, it's always kind of weirdly sick to me how many people, especially on social media, seem to be oh. cheerleading a crash in the housing market and grand yeah. misery for, for half the population. I find yeah. that to be exceedingly bizarre, but it's, uh, it's sick. It's a sickness. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad they consistently are wrong, you know, not yeah. just for the rest of us, but also for the sake of our, of our country's health, the fact that these people continue to be wrong, but I digress. Now, no, I think, I think what's happening is, is that, you know, you read all, you know, the headlines, and you know home prices and, and incomes and inflation and everything's really you know negative and certainly consumer sentiment has even been weak the last couple of years but the reality though is that by and large always there's exceptions that by and large you know the people have fared pretty well over these last few years in terms of incomes and jobs unemployment the lowest level in multiple decades wage growth has been the consistently the strongest in multiple decades you know wage growth is part of inflation too and oddly enough the fed you know obviously there's reason for this but you know ironically enough the fed even wants to see wage growth levels come down so yep. there's been a lot of people have more money and there's very little distress in the home ownership market right now. You know, most homeowners are in good shape. They locked in at low rates. They're they're right. they're sitting pretty. Why are they going to sell? You know, they're they're their 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 mortgages are affordable. They aren't paying eight percent. You know, they're they're paying three and four percent. So um, you have this kind of unique dynamic where homeowners are fine uh, for now. You know, and hopefully that remains the case. But they're not incentivized to sell in many cases unless they have to. Yeah, they're 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 protecting part of their asset, which is the mortgage. Yeah. Uh, you know, 25% of the country has a mortgage at or below 3%, 65% of the country has a mortgage at or below 4%, and 42% of the country has no mortgage at all. Yeah. <laughs> how, how, how do you get distress out of that? Like, it's, yeah. I just don't see it happening. I mean, even if we see unemployment spike quite a bit, these people, number one, they could probably afford their mortgage with much lower income than they have yeah. now. And if they couldn't, I think they would still just beg borrow or steal to protect that mortgage and take on a roommate, Airbnb their house. Now that market's in distress too, but you know, it's still there, right? They would just do whatever they could to make it work somehow. Yeah. And also too, it's, it's, you know, we learned a lot of lessons from the, from the GFC period, obviously. It's like, we don't see the same issue with arms. And ironically, that's more of an issue now in not all of it, but some niche of commercial real estate, the equivalent of that with short-term floating rate debt. 
but it's really not an issue in the single family market this time around. Uh, so it's not like everyone's resetting to higher rates. And so, you know, I, th- I think, again, barring some big shock, I mean, I think we're in pretty good shape. And even a big increase in unemployment, we were at double digit unemployment in 2020 and still, you know, didn't see the crash that people expected to see. Yeah, well, you know, people are going to take issue with that. They're going to say, well, they put moratoriums, no, in, yeah, and, you know, yeah. all that kind of stuff. But even and that, I, I'd be curious to look at the number I mean, and the stimulus money helped too. don't be wrong. But, right. you know, again, the point being is, is unless you have a sustained shock, I think we'll be able to weather through. And I, and I guess the other part of that too is most of these, uh, you know, banks are now set up to work with consumers much more than they did in 2008, 2009. I agree. Yeah, so they're going to do workouts, loan mods, and yeah. I think they're going to be more inclined to this time, not only because they're set up for it and they're mentally prepared for it, but also because, you know, they're simply going to see that that borrower has a good chance of making that loan perform if it becomes a non-performing loan, which now there's like almost none of those <laughs> in the entire yeah. country. So, yeah, uh, yeah, it's, yeah it's pretty, pretty much the only part of real estate seeing non-performing loans is the office sector. So, yeah. um, but most real estate is, and obviously residential is in good shape. Yeah. So the office sector is seeing that. And, you know, retail has been under a lot of pressure for quite a while with the Amazonification of, of you know, retail, the retail apocalypse. But how about the apartment market, though? I'm hearing some pretty decent, you know, amount of stress uh, with, you know, a lot of apartment syndicators being willing to sell like general partnership shares just to get funding. They took short term bridge loans, kind of expected appreciation. What are you seeing there? Yeah, well, it's it's interesting because I think what's going to, uh, if it's first of all, it's not really showing up yet, uh, meaning that like distress is not really bubbling up. Uh, bank loans are getting paid. You know, also, you know, Fannie, Freddie, life insurance companies, like there's no sign yet of non-performance other than a handful of deals that have been national news. And yeah, there was I mean, a big foreclosure like, in Texas, I think. In Houston. 430 yeah, in, units. Yeah, big one. Yeah. One in San Francisco. Yeah. And then there was uh, one for a portfolio based in New York. It had assets and all over the place. But, you know, it's it's very limited. In fact, um, MSCI Real Capital Analytics had a report recently showing that distressed sales on a trailing 12-month basis are actually down. It's just mm-hmm. the ones that are, are making a lot of noise. Now, yeah, that yeah. being said... Here's what happened. So most of those, uh, the peak was 2021, early 22 pricing rates. And so deals that happened then using short-term floating rate debt and with value add plans. So the equivalent, basically, if you're not familiar, if those listening are not familiar with multifamily, the value add short-term players are kind of like flippers in the single family market. They buy a house, fix it up and sell it at a higher price or in this, or they refinance and, uh, and cash out of it. So What's happened is that you're going to see some of these syndication groups, especially who bought at those peak prices and aren't able to do the value add work and also, too, are going to struggle at the higher rate when the two to three year term starts to, to mature and so or the rate cap expires. And so that timing really gets us to second half of this year and in the next year. We will see more of that. But, you know, I've sliced this day a lot of different ways. I mean, you're looking at you know, a lot of this is, um, you know, CMBS or CDOs, and that's that's a single digit percentage of the market. You know, most Fannie and Freddie loans, that's half the market for multifamily. And most of those are long term mortgages that uh, with very few maturing on the next couple of years. And so by and large, the market's in strong shape, but there's going to be a lot of noise coming from a small segment of the market. Do you see a lot more distress in the multifamily market or pretty? Well, it's, it's, there's going to be some uh, second half of this year, next year, but again, it's not going to be systematic. There's going to be pockets of distress among some segment of the market that bought at peak prices with short-term floating rate debt. But again, that's, that's it. We're looking at a single digit. It's a relatively small piece of the market. Yeah. And furthermore, I'll tell you what, there's a lot of what's so-called rescue capital lining up for these deals. And so mm-hmm. a lot of that's going to get worked out behind the scenes with preferred equity and MES loans right, um, right. and may never even, you know, you may never even see it officially mm-hmm. default. So there's going to be some of that, but you look at the overall health of, you know, the balance of multifamily debt in our country it's just, again, it's just, there's not enough of it maturing the next couple of years to be a systematic problem, barring a much bigger shock. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a good point. And we still have a housing shortage regardless, yes. you know, yes. even with 
a big supply of new multifamily hitting the market, you know, over, I guess, the past year or so. We've certainly all witnessed them being built in every city in America. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. you know, but but that'll get absorbed. I mean, how bad are those vacancies for the multifamily landlords? Uh, it, I mean, we're it's it's so bad that we're back to normal. You know, it's yeah, uh, so bad it, that we're back to normal. Yeah, <laughs> I love I mean, it. That's a great we, line. We were at two and a half percent vacancy uh, this time, you know, basically this time a year ago, and now oh. we're at five and a half percent vacancy. Oh. Oh. Um, you know, and even a ba- it's the great thing about about having a real estate or like a rental housing portfolio, whether you own single family, assuming you have a bunch of them, or multifamily, is like you always have cash flow. It's not like office or retail where you have one company move out, and you're at zero. You know, sometimes yeah. or twenty, right? You know, a bad apartment complex could be ninety percent occupied, and so. Right. Um, you know, I think it's really important to point out is again, barring a big shock, the issue for multifamily, even for the syndicators you mentioned, it's not occupancy and rents. Like the, everyone has some tolerance built in there to see, you know, some movement, even rents can go negative. But the issue is entirely related to the expense side of the ledger and especially the cost of debt. And so that's why those with short term float rate, shorting, short term debt are facing some challenges and especially in places like florida where the cost of insurance is doubled or tripled as well and that adds another layer of challenge to the expense side right yeah it's definitely an issue but you know overall those expenses pass through to tenants because there's just no supply if the landlords can't pass it through and that's ultimately what happens the thing that hurts though is that two-year adjustment period there's always an adjustment period in every right. market and every type of market and every asset. And that's the part that really gets people. And uh, you can't pass it all down at the same time. And yeah. again, especially for those that are in that situation I mentioned earlier, is if you are seeing increased vacancies, you can't pass all that down to the resident in a one year period. And oh, so of course not. Yeah. it's going to be challenging for pockets of the market in the short term. But uh, mm-hmm. I think again, long term, we need more supply. So it'll be the demand, the demand will be there. That's the nice thing. At least every investor knows that we need more supply. And if you yes. have supply, the world is somehow going to want to rent it from you <laughs> so, or yes. buy it from you. So, so that's good. You mentioned, of course, the office market, which is in major distress. COVID just changed the game as far as office and, and hybrid work schedules or, or completely remote work and so forth. And the move away from cities to suburbia. What do you think about the reuse? I, I watch a lot of YouTube channels about the reuse of shopping malls, converting them to housing, converting office buildings to housing. These conversions are expensive. I mean, yeah. I even wonder if they're practical at all, uh, or it's just better to start over from scratch. But do you think we're going to see a significant supply of residential units come from conversions of offices, shopping malls, anything else? Well, I very I wish I can say yes because I think it's a, those projects are always so cool. It's such a great like adaptive reuse. It's such a great concept for many many reasons. But unfortunately, as you alluded to, it's just not practical. And um, these deals are expensive. Conversions are oftentimes more expensive than just starting a, demolishing and starting new. But also, too, a lot of these buildings, especially office buildings, are not the, the, the building plates are not conducive to residential, meaning like they're so deep that you can't build, you know, a apartments or residential units inside these places you have really long awkward floor plans with a lot of windowless bedrooms and, and some no cities plumbing like, yeah you have to redo all the building plumbing electrical all that kind of stuff so it's a lot of drilling through concrete and building in new things so it's just not easy and the ones that do happen tends to have you know usually like a lot of times they're so maybe everyone pictures these in their minds but the cool ones that we've all seen are usually associated with some sort of historic building tax credit um and, you know, again, there's only so many deals that are really going to fit that profile. So yeah. we'll see more of it, but it's not going to move the needle in terms of overall housing stock, unfortunately. It's not going to solve the shortage problem. No. And is anything else a disruptive technology like 3D printed houses? Yeah. I, I, I know the answer. It's not. But, you know, I'm just curious. No, it's not. But I will say, like, I think the answer is more the all the above as opposed to, you know, one thing. I will say it's like, right, uh, right. you know, Graystar recently, the biggest property manager in the country, they're they're working on, uh, they have a, now built a, a factory to build modular uh, apartments. And, you know, I mean, it's great. I, I think the more we try different things and uh, try to combat the cost of construction for new housing is worth trying. So I'm, I'm hoping that we can come up with some different ways that collectively help move the needle. 
Yeah, that's a good point. It's not one thing. It's a whole bunch of things doing doing this, that, and the other thing. You know, it's it's great having you on, Jay. What else do you want people to know? What do you want to share as we wrap it up? Well, I, I guess I guess the one last thing I would share is that as you introduced me, you know, I'm a big believer that rental housing is essential. It's important. It's misunderstood. And I think especially now when, you know, all the the so-called, as you mentioned, like the, the crash bros and the housing bubble people, and you start to hear the same thing now for the apartment stock people, they're, everyone's, everyone's excited to watch a crash of some sort. But, you know, it's in the long term, as you alluded to, you said it several times, is we still need housing. And I think that for housing investors, you know, especially if you have the ability to be longer term investors and you're not you're not as sensitive to what happens in the next year or two, you know, given all the noise in the economy and whatnot, then you know, you're you're gonna be fine by and large for the most part. And housing is essential. And I think COVID remind us of that. You could work from anywhere, you can shop from anywhere. But uh, you can order food from anywhere. But at the end of the day, you need a place to live. Yeah. And I think that's a big tailwind for housing of all types. And that place to live has actually become more important if it becomes your place to work, too. Yeah. So yeah, it, it's, it's like doubly important now. So, yeah, yeah. Very interesting points. Jay, give out your website or Twitter or whatever you want. Yeah, well, you could find me on uh, Twitter, just uh, at Jay Parsons. And also I'm on LinkedIn. I post there a lot. And our website is realpage.com slash analytics of a blog there. Our team posts a lot of articles there as well. Excellent. Jay Parsons, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Jason. 